wunderschönen guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Geraldine de Bastion und ich freue mich sehr, heute Abend die Runde Algorithmische Utopien moderieren zu dürfen. Und ich werde jetzt auf Englisch wechseln. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us here at HAU. I'm very excited to moderate the discussion around algorithmic utopias this evening and would like to begin by introducing the topic and the speakers that we have invited for you. So automation and artificial intelligence are the bringers today of hope and of fear. Will we be able to free human resources and minds and unleash our creativity and our potential so we can no longer work but rather enjoy a life of leisure and experience? Or are we making ourselves the subjects of new benevolent dictators taking away our free will? perhaps even transgressing into a trans or post-human existence as we merge our biological self with our digital creations. Those are some of the themes and topics that I look forward to discussing for the next one hour and 15 minutes with the three distinguished guests that we have invited and hopefully also all of you. So let me introduce um, the, the speakers for you. I'm very excited to be joined by Malka Oda. She's a writer, an aid worker and an academic and named Senior Fellow for Technology and Risk at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs for 2015. She has more than a decade of experience in humanitarian aid and development, ranging from field-level experiences in the head office of Darfur to supporting global programs and agency-wide strategy in disaster risk reduction and, and as a technical specialist. So really on the ground field work in conflict areas and developing countries. Um, but she's also a science fiction writer and has published the thriller Informocracy, which was named one of the best books in 2016 by Kirkus, Book Riot, and the Washington Post, and is also the author of the sequels Null States and State Tectonics. The full trilogy was nominated for the Hugo Award. Please give a warm round of applause and welcome to Marka. I'm also joined by John Donea, who is a lecturer at the law school. Um, sorry, and you, <laughs> that's a lecturer at uh, NUI Galway in Ireland. And his research focuses on ethical, legal, and social implication of new technologies. John writes a blog called Philosophical Distinquisitions and produces a podcast with the same title. He also writes for the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies and has recently published a book called Automation and Utopia, which she's brought a copy with for you to take a look at. <laughs> Very excited to have you here tonight as well, John. Please have another warm round of applause. And last but not least, I'm joined by Sasha Alonka, who is an AI policy researcher and program manager at the Future Society. Sasha's work centers around data governance, privacy, and how to build inclusive and non-discriminatory AI systems. She has also worked for international organizations such as OECD, researched the impact of social and ecological trends in Latin America, and has worked for civic tech company Blue Nove and specialized in collective intelligence processes. Also, a big round of applause, please. So we have some pretty big topics that we want to plow through during the course of our discussion. We're also going to invite you to join it. But before we start digging into some of the questions on how we can imagine algorithmic utopias, I want to start a little bit by asking you each how you go about your work. Um, we live in a day and age, and also here in Germany, in a country where we tend to think about the risks and the challenges of digitization and see the techno-dystopian futures way more clearly than the utopias. Um, and I'd like to begin with you and, and circle around. You have worked in some very, very difficult circumstances and situations. I'm so curious how you combine the practical field work that you do in your development work and your science fiction writing and how you embarked on this process of imagining the futures that you describe in your novels. Mm, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I, you know, I find that my experience of working in different places is really critical for my work in terms of imagining new places. Because one of the things that you get when you travel is you get a sense of difference and a possibility and a variety. Particularly if you spend a, a, you know, a certain amount of time in each place as opposed to just being there briefly. Um, 
And particularly, you know, as someone who wants to write about the future, we're, we're really writing more about the present. But we're finding a way to look at the present through a different lens when we write science fiction. Um, and when we're thinking about technology and the spectrum of technology and the range of different kinds of technology that we can expect, that we can look forward to, that we can fear, uh, it's useful to have lived in places that feel very different in their approach to technology. So you mentioned my time in Darfur and you know, to have lived in a place where there was no grid electricity, um, there was a period of time when I didn't have email for about a month or six weeks, and so we were sending USB uh, back and forth on the helicopter that came once a week to get, <laughs> because we still had paperwork, so there was, there was paperwork going back and forth in that way. And it was really useful to me to have that time outside of technology to then really think about what we're doing when we engage with technology. And um, in the novels that you have published, you explore different concepts that we're going to dig a little bit deeper into um, in, the, in the next couple of rounds. But maybe I would also be just interested in you outlining a little bit without giving away your tricks as a writer. But how did you go about sort of freeing your mind from the experiences that you gathered and trying to imagine democracies that just functioned in a new novel way? So for me, in, in the books that I wrote, The Sentinel Cycle, starting with Infomocracy, I really started with things that I found very uh, frustrating and shocking and anachronistic in the way that they're treated in this world. And so I began by trying to imagine something that would work differently. But I never wanted to construct it as a utopia because I think that utopias are largely impossible and for narrative purposes, they're not very useful because it tends to be boring once everything's perfect. Um, might be great, but not really for writing a thriller. So I was just trying to find um, some ideas that came out of my frustrations and do something different from the way we do it here. Um, but then also approach it as I started writing the story with a skeptical eye and really try to think about the unintended consequences that would come from these ideas, think about things that were both good and bad, and the way that the different characters I could imagine would interact with that world. So I tried to approach it as a, a setting that was rich in terms of giving my characters things to do and conflicts and ideals and work from there. Excellent, and like I said, I'm interested very much in exploring some of the concepts about microstates and information overflow and narrative addictions um, that, you, that you explain in your novels in a moment. Um, John, you also, not, very, not from a fictional, but from an academic um, point of view, think about the future of humanity. Um, automation in Germany rings a bell of fear in the sense that the main narrative that we have at the moment is this idea that we're going to be put out of work in a society that is based around labor and identity is based around labor. Um, how did you try to also free your mind from these thoughts and think about automation and the future of humanity in a different way? Yeah, I mean, so I'm a legal academic, not a lawyer, I just always say that. Don't ask me for advice by background and training, but I'm primarily a philosopher by vocation, so effectively what I do is I take the kind of science fictional speculations that Malka performs, and I take away all the good bits, <laughs> all the narrative complexity and interesting stories, and turn it into analytical arguments. So I focus on defining concepts such as utopia, other things like um, free will, which you mentioned before, and figuring out the various ways in which technology affects this. And I'm primarily interested in not so much in what will happen in the future or how that future will come about, but how we should think about the future in evaluative terms. So whether it's a good or bad thing and how we can think systematically and rigidly about that. So most authors shy away from the term utopia. Um, I could just mention a couple of reasons why, but the reasons are multifold. You put it right on there. It's in like big capital letters in your title. How, how come? Yeah, I mean, I should say that you know, most of my work actually does focus on the risks of technology invariably. When we are looking at it from the perspective of the ethical, legal, and social implications, our mind tends to turn towards the negative implications of technology and the risks that we need to mitigate and avoid. But I guess through a combination of contrariness and interest, I wanted to see if there was anything in the concept of utopia, which is much maligned. People avoid using the term. They don't like using 
the concept or to refer to themselves as utopianists, see if there was anything in the concept that could be rehabilitated. And I suspect the definition or understanding of utopia that I prefer is one that allows for a certain amount of openness and conflict and not, it's not a, a state, a kind of placid society where everything is perfect. It's one in which there is dynamism and optimism towards the future and not uh, something where we've reached an ideal end point for society. Um, and I think that's what utopia is. It's a society that's dynamic and open-ended and full of possibilities, not something that is on a downward decline. Progress instead of perfection. Um, uh, Sasha, you work as, a, as an analyst, as a policy researcher, some, I mean, like, and especially on the topics that you deal with, the world can seem pretty bleak at times. And yet you also, in your work, try to develop new concepts that sort of look beyond the, um, the present that you find. Um, how, do you, how do you go about doing that? And maybe you can share a little bit also about the methodologies that you use for this. Sure, sure, sure. And sorry for the people who were on the previous panel because it might be a bit repetitive with some of the concepts which were uh, previously introduced, but um, AI, as many of you might think, is a very um, expert scene topic. Many people are very frightened to speak about it, even more, you know, to try and define its course. And so what we have done at the Future Society is really, you know, in thinking about the global governance of AI trying to implicate one of the voices which was missing, which was a citizen one. And in doing so, we have relied on design fiction um, because this was a powerful tool, you know, to free people's imaginaries, to make this uh, debate accessible to everyone, and also to have this impression that the AI trajectory is not linear, is not something which has already been predetermined. It's in the hands of everyone. Um, and I definitely think, you know, in the current topic where Often, you know, people don't feel entitled to speak about such a topic, and especially about the governance framework. We need to like have more have more call for this and find some methodology, such as a collective intelligence methodology, where you try, you know, and have the broadest amount of people to participate on a topic, the most diverse voices, but also to canalize it to make, you know, the main ideas um, being able to be replicated. Um, can you explain a little bit more for our audience that might not be familiar um, what, how does speculative design work and how do your collective intelligence processes work? Sure, sure. Uh, so for the people who were there previously, Catherine Dufour, who was a writer of science fiction, was actually participating to one of our um, design fiction workshops. So the way that we do it might seem very simplistic and literally like it can be like scaled in many different places. Um, but so we bring people into a room and we define a topic, can be uh, the future of AI, can be the future of AI through education, through healthcare, etc. We give some like very small instructions, so icebreakers such as, you know, like what is the opening sentence? Do you have a dialogue? Um, is it set in a special place? And then we give people uh, in a small group of three, um, half an hour, to just, you know, bring some, some ideas, try, you know, and write a short story, and then share it with people. And not everything is good, but most of it, like, is super interesting, you know? And we definitely have some ideas coming from it. And I guess the goal of it is not necessarily for everything to be perfect, you know, and to be immediately transferred to policy, you know, frameworks, but to, ice, to like do an icebreaker, you know, to really have people feeling entitled again to speak about those topics. Excellent, thank you. And some of the results of what came out and some of the ideas you generated to that, we also hope to talk about a little bit in the next round. So let's start talking about some of these um, concepts that we've developed in the, like, question of how will or could humanity progress uh, through automation and AI. And maybe, John, I can ask you to begin a little bit. You are, I've, I've read in one of the articles that you published on the topic that your book is also dealing with, we should all hate our jobs, and if we don't right now, we should, we should in future. How, why is that so? Okay. Um, so there are five reasons why you should hate your job. And they're all articulated in the third chapter of the book. I mean, basically, you have to get into what a job is and what work is before you can talk about why you should hate it. So some people have very broad, open-ended definitions of what it means to work. It could just be any physical activity, any mental activity that is somehow arduous or difficult, um, or it could be even broader than that. And so. I tend to adopt a narrower definition of work, which is really work in an economic sense. It's activity performed under some kind of condition of economic uh, need or necessity, although that might be mis 
leading since some people don't have to work for a living. It's more performed out of uh, desire for an economic reward. So it's a world in which physical activity is valorized through some kind of monetary measure of, of success. And so I think a world in which you perform activities that is valorized in this way and is performed under those conditions is a bad thing and that you should want a world that uh, is beyond that, a post-work world. I mean, I could maybe mention a couple of the reasons for thinking that. One is just that I think that work is may, a... May I just jump in yeah? before? Yeah, I would love to, just to ask, allow me one question before you um, want to tell some of the reasons. Just to recap, if I understood correctly. So you define the kind of work you mean as kind of the decoupling of paid labor to, um, to work. Um, does that include forms of social work? Like, of course, we have a lot of discussion still about is housework, bringing up children, rearing a family, is that considered work, although it's not paid in our society? Or, the, uh, of course, in the, I, hope, I hope you forgive me, and I, or I hope actually you share this in all these discussion rounds, Captain Picard immediately springs to mind that you know the bettering of oneself and learning and studying um, should be the work that we could do in future, at least in the Star Trek Utopia. So does, do you include those kinds of form of work in your definition? Yeah, I mean, there are several entries for Star Trek in the index, so it gets mentioned quite a bit. Um, but, I mean, on the question of there are certain forms of work nowadays, like social work and care work, that are not maybe valued in the economic sense, um, I tend not to focus on those because I'm critiquing largely the current capitalistic model of work and what, the way in which work is... Um, valued in a capitalistic society, so things that aren't currently valued by that society I tend to exclude from the critical discussion. And, you know, part of the justification for doing that is that, you know, people who worry about social work and care work not being valued, one of the claims that they make is that it should be valued and should be, we should attach some greater monetary value to it, and that's the way of solving the problem around those forms of work, is to turn them into capitalistic modes of labor, which is actually what we have done to a large extent in Western countries by putting a price on care work and outsourcing care work to particular um, groups of, of humans. But another alternative answer to that problem is to try and move everything away from being valorized in the market. So you want to throw in a couple of those reasons why it's a good idea? Yeah, sure. So what I argue is that in the present world, work is like a collective action problem. It's almost like a tragedy of the commons and that it's individually rational for each person to want a job. It's the way of getting ahead. It's the way of caring for your family, providing for your family. Um, but the collective result of this is a negative state of affairs for the majority of people. They have less freedom. Work kind of monopolizes their attention and their minds. Nowadays, even when you're not working, you have to think about work, you have to develop your employability, develop your skills. Work is becoming increasingly precarious as a result of technology, which increases the anxiety around this need to perform and develop yourself so that you are valued by the market. And it also is a source of inequality. There's significant polarization in the workplace. Certain people win out, other people lose out and get a much worse deal from the workplace. And finally, I do quote some surveys internationally that a lot of people are just very dissatisfied by the work that they do. They don't feel that it makes any contribution, makes any difference. A lot of people feel, to use a phrase that's in a book by an author whose name I now forget, um, it'll come back to me, there's a book called uh, Bullshit Jobs. A lot of people think that they're performing bullshit jobs, jobs that have no purpose or meaning. And so we, we, we have a lot of anxiety and competition, a lot of attention dedicated to something that makes us very dissatisfied. And so that's why I think you should want to imagine a post-work world. Your novels are set in the year, or in democracies at least, are set in the year 2060, if I'm not mistaken. Are people still working in 2060? Uh, people still are. I, I would also very much like to imagine a world without work, although um, one of the things that I find interesting listening to you talk about it is the fact that, I mean, I personally don't hate my job, but I don't hate it because I have an extremely privileged job that I can be very flexible around and um, get paid, even if it's not a lot, to do stuff I love. 
And so one of the, the things I'm curious about is the fact that in our society, we tend to recompense much more the jobs that are more pleasant and the jobs that are really terrible and do terrible things to people's bodies and minds and health um, and families are the ones that get paid very, very little. It's, I'm, I'm just curious, before I go on to talk about my book, I'd like to hear how you approach that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the chapter opens, since I'm an academic, I talk about how the fact that I really like my job and I find it quite pleasant, so I'm, I'm arguing... I was thinking that might be true for most of us here. I'm arguing against myself in that chapter mm. as well. And like, partly it's because of that reason, it's that I, I've won out in a labor market that treats a lot of people much worse. There's a, an American economist called David Autour, and he talks about this polarization effect in, in the modern digital workplace, that you have a narrow group of people, the 10 top 10%, the top 1% to engage in creative forms of work and they feel very positive about it. It's very rewarding, there's a lot of, of high-end cognitive work, it's creative and so forth. But the vast majority of people, the vast majority of workers are in a much worse, get a much worse deal. And so I could sit back and say, I'm very happy that I've won out, yeah. but I should really be thinking more, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. I could have been one of the people who lost out, and I may be one of the people who ends up losing out in the near future. I may get displaced by technology as well. I think the other, um, the first section of your book, uh, the other question is in our pursuit of, of happiness and prosper, prospering, what is better for humanity? And um, I thought it was very interesting how you try to sort of deconstruct some of the assumptions that we have of where the human should be better than the machine and put a question mark behind that if that is really the case. Mm. Um, but maybe we can link into that a little bit also yes. with the, you know, where is the machine sort of the, um, the supply of information and where is it the controlling factor in your life? Yeah, actually, um, so it's, it's interesting to look at from the perspective of my book in which um, one of the main things that has changed in this future is that there is a large global bureaucracy that deals with information management. So basically information is seen as a public good and there's this kind of UN slash Google um, but international organization basically runs off of the interest from uh, the money that they got out of large civil suits against diet soda lying to people and also the cable news lying to people. And so this money was put into trust. They have an enormous infrastructure. And one of the things they have is an enormous bureaucracy. And this is partly kind of drawing from the UN image, right? That there's all these people who are being put to work again, sort of for a purpose, um, but it, it, is, it is a bureaucracy. There are a lot of people with sort of relatively grunt, boring jobs. Um, but one of the things that I get asked a lot about the book is, where is the AI? Why isn't this all being run by a massive machine? And to me, it actually didn't make sense to think about it that way. I think that we are, are certainly seeing some things being more automated but we're seeing also how poorly that works, um, particularly in some of these questions of information. Um, you know, we do have AI running our feeds right now. What we see, what we, if you're online, if you're still watching cable news, then there's probably a person in there deciding that what they're gonna show you about the world. But if you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, it's an algorithm that's uh, pointing you towards certain bits of news and certain advertisements, and frankly, it doesn't work that well. Uh, it's not very good at predicting what I want or who I want to be friends with or what I want to buy. Uh, it may get better in the next 50 years. It probably will get better, <laughs> depressingly. But I also think that, that there's, we're likely to see some sort of pendulum swing back to um, having people more involved in some of these questions that are cognitive and ethical and relational. And uh, whether that's a good or bad thing, I'm not trying to, to argue in the book, but I do think that you know, that there is a, 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 an importance to that personal connection. Mm -hmm. So the question is kind of out there though, is the AI, the, the AIs that we are living with today, are they just not there yet? Or are they just not designed to do that, to supply us with the um, trustworthy and fair and, and well sort of balanced information, but rather designed to trap us into their, the capitalist systems, really. That's something that you work on as well, Sasha. I work on absolutely, but before moving on this point, maybe I haven't read your short story yet, but do you think that basically like the, the point here is that if ever we delegate, you know, like bureaucracy to an AI, 
rather than a human, then this might condition us and we might like, you know, have less, uh, like more information asymmetry basically. But I see this as two different things. Like maybe we can delegate part of, you know, the more boring work, quote unquote, you know, to bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Like I live in France, where we're one of the most bureaucratic countries in the world. And honestly, it's such a pain each time we have to pay our taxes, you know, or open a business, etc. So I feel this is the kind of thing I'm happy to delegate some of my um, information, knowing the transparency of it. But on some other things, for example, like the social media information, this is something which is on a different level, where I definitely want more transparency and more, you know, like human agency on it. But I see as like two kind of processes that we can automate differently, and where the automation you now comes, yeah, with a different, different granularity. Yes, absolutely. And there's certainly automation. There's certainly algorithms going on in this in this bureaucracy that I imagine. Um, but it's not what a lot of people expect when they ask me about it. You know, the AI that manages everything for the, yeah. for the organization. It's not that at all. Um, it's a lot of people, some of them, what they do is they fine tune algorithms. There's, yeah. for example, one thing is there's a huge translation bureau. And a lot of the rough translation gets done by machine. But uh, there's quite a lot of, of smoothing that goes on, especially because this is an organization that wants a lot of granularity. It wants everything to be available to all people. So if there's slang, if there's dialects, if there's you know, sub-dialects, and they, they try to have people involved to make sure that that gets really refined. Um, so I, in the book, at least, there's a sense that it's uh, not quite there yet that the machines are not quite there yet, and also that there's an interest in keeping people involved in some of these decisions. No, I see what you mean, that basically we cannot delegate everything, that we need to like maintain a level of uh, control, at least for now, mm -hmm. and that there's a danger also of being completely like, yeah, outsourced by this. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask you a question, because you, some of your work is on this idea of collective intelligence, yes. and I appreciate that that's a, a term that means different things to different people sometimes, but one of my interpretations of it anyway is that we think sometimes in these binary terms that it's either individual human intelligence or machine intelligence. And that's partly what's coming up in this conversation here, but like where is the AI in your system? Why isn't the AI managing everything right. as opposed to humans managing it? Yeah. But one un interpretation of collective intelligence is that it's a way of getting humans to cooperate with one another in intelligent ways, but also humans to cooperate with machines in intelligent ways. So it's, it's not this binary trade-off between human or machine, it's a way of collaborating and integrating and coordinating with machines. Is that how you yeah, view I it? fully agree with this. I think there's like, maybe it comes in different phases, right? The first step can be like by adding some of the different human knowledges, and then you can also add a layer of AI, and actually that's what we did in our consultation on the impact of AI. So we had different people posting some messages, and we really tried to make it, you know, like available in different languages, trying also through UX design, you know, to make it like very smooth, very ergonomic. But then we also had some layer of AI, you know, to like link some ideas together and make it appear. And so I definitely like, I agree, you know, we're not trying to polarize the debate. Collective intelligence doesn't have to be like all of the humans versus the machine. I do think we can gain from each other, but it has to be maybe like applied differently according to the context. It seems to me that that is part of the um, situation we're generally in when we talk about AI, that there's this humans against the technology. And very often we take things for given, especially again, like when it comes to automation and the replacement of certain jobs, rather than thinking creatively of how do we want machines and humans to interact? What role do we want humans to play in a future society? How do you try to like open that up and allow for such different narratives th through your work? All of you. <laughs> uh, I mean, for myself as, as a writer and not someone who is um, an, an expert necessarily in AI, although I've been kind of dragged in that direction since my, my books came out. Um, but, but as a writer, one of the things I always try to do is um, really question the, the mainstream narratives because for me to write something that is what everybody already b believes is boring uh, and not useful to the world. So, and I think we're, particularly with AI and, and also with the automation of jobs and so on, there is this very strong kind of mainstream narrative in the news that we see over and over again. And it's sometimes referenced obliquely through photos that are attached to articles where, you know, where they decide whether <laughs> they're talking about an AI, but they put a humanoid robot 
and it's female for certain things, and it's male for other things, and you know, or for the, the automation on jobs, they'll put pictures that suggest lots of people being out of work, and it's horrible. And so I'm very resistant to those, and so I, when, I, when I try to think about um, writing about AI, I try to think in ways that break away from some of those narratives. Uh, I'm particularly frustrated with this idea of, you know, the super rational, hyper-logical thing that's gonna decide humans aren't worthwhile. So I wrote a st short story about an AI that was specifically designed to have empathy and emotions and learn about emotions from humans in order to have an emotional intelligence. Um, this is not something that I, I see as a scientific thing, but it's a way of questioning why we always talk about AI in this one particular pattern. It's also calling the questions exactly as you're saying, you know, there's such an anthropomorphic representation of AI. Whenever you type like AI, you know, often we use it in our presentations and, you know, like the consultation we built. It was impossible, you know, nearly to find some pictures which are not like robots. Female robots often, Sophia the robot, you know. I'm coming in from a very anecdotal level, but I watched Ex Machina with my father the other day, and he was aghast when it ended and said, why are they not paying attention to the very first rule of robotics and AI as soon as the movie ended, and why is some Google guy just building sex robots in a den? And this is troubling, yeah. And again, those are kind of the images and the ideas that we create, um, and the sort of the futures that we're, we're playing with. Um, the way that you described AI in the now, again, had me think, but those are design questions, right? That's because a lot of these technologies are being designed by a specific group of people that usually tend to be white men in well-paid jobs, and there's a lack of diversity of creating the technologies around us. And, and there's a certain amount of vicious cycle there as well, because when you have movies like that, where the, the guy seems cool to a certain audience, then those people who watch it, and they uh, integrate it, and then they, they have, they become into some position of power, they have a lot of money, and they think they want to make robots like that and be that cool guy. And, and then it, it goes on and on. I mean, we know a lot of these big tech bros were fans of science fiction when they were younger, and the science fiction they were reading was very much tech bro -y science fiction. And so, you know, that's what we get over and over again, these specific ideas of um, what they're gonna build that doesn't include a, a perspective from citizens that doesn't include a, a broader group of people talking about what they want out of this technology, and that's a problem. So allow me one more question, um, back to the sort of future of work um, topic. One idea is that our econ economies are data-driven now, and data has a greater increasing value in our societies, and all of us individually are providing that data, but at the moment we're providing it free um, in return for some digital services, and very much is the debate around data sovereignty at the moment also going in a direction that we might need to find different ways to involve the citizizing, citizen and capitalizing in these processes. You've developed some ideas around that. Maybe we don't need to work in future because we're monetizing on our data. Can you explain a little bit how you, how you imagine that? Sure. So this comes more linked to the concept of data privacy. And basically that, you know, um, we're feeding this algorithm with some personal data and it's a business model, you know, which is sustainable like this. But I think there's really a lack of awareness of the value we're providing for this and a lack of granularity again. Um, what I'm trying to say is that when we speak about data privacy, it tends to be a very bipolar debate. You know, it's either you share everything or nothing, when really there are different solutions to it and different preferences. As a, as a person, you know, I have some, some individual preferences. There are some things I might give for free, like my name, for example. There are some things, you know, I'm absolutely not going to give, for example, yes, a conversation with a friend, and something I'm open to negotiation. How come we don't have a granularity of option for this? How come, you know, we don't also gain awareness of it? And so, I think the debate around data like monetization or currency is a way for people to gain awareness for it, of course, with some shortcomings, because then maybe we're going to monetize people differently. So if ever you someone you know at the higher end of the social pyramid, um, maybe your data is going to like make you um, gain more than someone you know who is like a student who just you know finished, just graduated. So there are some dangers to it, but I think it's a first step towards gaining more awareness to it and negotiating. Basically, you know, we have to go back to the negotiation table and not think that all of those models of social media are fatalistic and there's no counterpower to it, but starting, you know, saying, okay, this is what I prefer, what do you have to propose? 
So I'm a big fan of giving more control and power into the hands of people who are creating and supplying the data at the moment, just subjects. What I'm a little bit concerned about is that we're looking again at yeah, capitalizing on a system, perhaps bringing new forms of um, money label attachments to, to things that we could think about also using perhaps in a shared way. As um, I'm a big fan of the work of Francesca Bria, for instance, and people imagining how open data-driven societies could look like, rather than seeing how we can add another price tag to everything. Um, you also touched a little bit on the topic of, of trying to monetize everything and squeezing everything even furthermore into our capitalistic concepts. Can we imagine perhaps a data-driven future in a more commons way? This is complementary, actually. Like having this granularity where you don't see like the black and white and you see the gray, especially like enables you to see how there's this kind of like space for data that you just want to share, you know, for good. And this is like, I think the whole topic with like data commons or a commons and actually the future society, we have an initiative on this. And it's uh, trying, you know, to make a platform, bring some private and public actors, NGOs, governments, who are able to um, connect problem owners with solution, you know, problem solvers. And because today, you know, one of the biggest challenges for AI for good, NGOs, you know, using, I don't know, AI to prevent natural catastrophes is the access to data and how expensive it is. Mm -hmm. And so we are able, you know, we can unlock the solutions. We just have to, again, see this gray zone and create a platform to put action into it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I have a couple of things to say about that. People have been talking about this notion of monetizing private data for quite some time. I seem to recall so Jared Lanier wrote a book maybe a decade ago called Who Owns the Future, which is about this ideal of micropayments for the kinds of data that we provide online. I guess the challenge always is how do we get from here to there, and whether that's a, a realistic reality based on the way in which the digital infrastructure is currently owned and controlled by large tech corporations who effectively extract a rent from the majority of people. I'm sorry, I'm sounding like a, a Marxist. I'm not really in practice. I'm a, That's okay. a little bit more moderate. <laughs> but um, I mean, so there's an interesting conversation in data ethics at the moment, to just, which touches upon this as well, which is about the notion of some moral duty to, to share data. And this is already happening in healthcare. The notion that there is a duty to share public health data as a way of improving disease to uh, detection and mitigation. And I can imagine a larger argument developing around that about a, a duty to share data. Now, I don't know if framing it in the terms of duty is a, the best way to think of it, because it is imposing this obligation on people rather than encouraging them to share it for good reasons themselves. But either way, this notion that sharing data is a good thing. So one area where this might come up in the near future is actually around the automation of cars. That it, it may be the case that in order to have a safe automated driving network, we need to share a lot of data. And people who don't share their data, who have the right to refuse sharing their data, are effectively free riding on the data that the rest of us are sharing mm -hmm. and gaining an advantage over us. So I think we're gonna have to think a lot about this topic in the future around and uh, maybe a public duty or virtue of sharing data. Uh, if if yeah. I could just um, also answer to, to talk about the situation that I describe in my book, which again, I did not write as a utopia, so it's not intended to be this is what I think should happen. However, it's, um, you know, it's something that I think is an interesting proposal to put out, which is in the book, as I said, information is a public good. So the infrastructure is publicly owned. Um, and in fact, all of the data is pretty much publicly owned. There is privacy, there are no cameras inside people's homes. But in public spaces, pretty much everything is available to the entire world. And it takes the bottom out of the data market because it's all free and available, so there's no more surveillance capitalism, there's no value to that data because it's so available. Now, of course, the title of my book is Infomocracy, the ones who manage the information rule. So there's, <laughs> there's still a question of how you manage data and how you use data in a situation where it's all completely available, and that's largely where the struggles go on in the book. Um, but it, it sort of takes a radical suggestion of what would happen if all of a sudden 
all of that data was made public. And you know, I, I do agree that privacy is very much a relative thing. What people want um, to keep private is very different over different times and places. And so I think the important thing for us to keep our eye on is not which pieces of data specifically are being regulated so much as who has control over that data and who knows how that data is being used. Because one of the big problems we have now is not only are we giving our data away for free, but we don't even know what's being done with it. And, and what will happen to it in the future, right? That is one of the core concerns also for privacy activists, all the ideas about function creep and not to be able to preempt what might be done with the data that we're collecting in the near future, especially with change in, in political moods and policies and regimes. Um, but yeah, do, would you agree, is radical openness the only way to sort of counteract the surveillance capitalism that we're experiencing today and the power that we have accumulated in very, very few platforms? Oh, I, I would be very frightened of it, actually. Maybe that's my French side taking over, you know, but no, I, I really care for my privacy and it's not because I have something to hide, it's just because that's the, that's the way I am, you know, that's the way I like to interact with people. Um, and also it's like not just being open, it's being opened but how is information used by who, you know, and for what? And right now, I think this is one of the, the biggest challenges that we don't know this, and maybe in an ideal world, but I would be sure that, you know, the government or whether third party would be benevolent and acting for my best interest, maybe it would be more open, but even like this, I think individual preferences still kick in. I mean, I tend to think, I'm, I'm not somebody who thinks that privacy is necessarily an intrinsic good, that it's always and everywhere a good thing. But I do believe that privacy is a protection against the imperfection of the world. So what I mean by that is that maybe a perfectly transparent society would be a good thing if everyone else was morally perfect. And we, we did nothing to fear from them. They were never going to use this information in a way that would harm us or undermine us. But that's not the world in which we live. So we need some bulwark, some protection against the imperfection of others. Hmm. But we, it, it seems to be sort of an, like a little bit of an unsolvable situation that we have. Of course, as you just described, the idea of retaining some form of individual privacy, but perhaps at the same time seeing that, um, yeah, the data that we need to power the societies that we live in today need to be open. We're not going to solve the problem about accumulating data into big data packages and being able to deconstruct that back to perhaps tracing the individual, at least not technologically at the moment and in the foreseeable future. So it's definitely sort of one of the questions out there how that could be managed for the greater public good whilst not fulfilling the individual rights. I mean, so that's why I think some of this debate in but the ethics of, of data sharing is, is useful because it I, tries to identify specific contexts in which the sharing of data is a public good. Um, and actually one analogy that I use in framing this is that sometimes the sharing of public data is almost like vaccination. You know, vaccination is good if 95% of the population get vaccinated because it's, um, you need this herd immunity. In some contexts, you have a similar phenomenon with data that you need this very significant threshold of people to share um, data and you get this public good as a result, this kind of herd immunity or herd benefits as a result. Yeah. So maybe let's look a little bit about at some of the different sectors that you deal with in your writing. Um, in the first part of your book, as I mentioned earlier, I think you outline very well how we have these assumptions that humans are good at things, right? Like in Germany, of course, with automated driving coming up, we have a lot of conversations around how well equipped humans are to drive cars, as if that was a natural and a given thing, whereas, in fact, of course, it's not. And, um, and in some of, you go through um, medical diagnoses, through insurance companies, through a lot of sort of industries and show how this assumption is not necessarily correct, that humans are better at doing things than machines or AIs are. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's true in some contexts. Humans are the weak link in a system, and addressing that through automation can be a good thing. But one of the points I tried to make in the book, and this goes back to our earlier conversation about this binary, this choice between human or machine, why can't it be something in between? One point I do try to make is that in certain contexts, we are creating environments in which 
it is impossible for humans to actually engage in meaningful collaboration with machines, certain areas of work and um, public life as well. So partly this is a function of how complex and fast moving the modern world is, that we need machines to understand and manage that complexity. One example of this, which should be quite intuitive, is in the world of finance and financial trading. That's an environment in which actually algorithms are needed to and control and make sense of it. That's partly a result of a kind of an arms race within the financial system where you need these fast algorithms that can identify information quickly and respond to it quickly. But that sets up this strategic dynamic whereby people who are trying to regulate and manage and control that system have to rely on algorithms to try and track and trace and solve, uh, solve the problems created by algorithms. So we're, we're creating a world in which human machine complementarity or collaboration is no longer possible. And that's one of the things I wanted to kind of highlight and discuss in the book. Those are the, some of the things I think that bring out the fear, right? The idea that we're building systems that we can no longer control <clears throat> and that we're gonna have to build other systems that control the system and the human is no longer part of a system of checks and balances. Um, understandably, I think that that sparks fear in some people when we already live in a world today as we establish that we have black box algorithms in public sector, sector institutions like predictive policing, or I think we all know the case from the US where um, jail sentences are being generated by an AI that have huge racial biases, or topics such as uh, dark patterns and design issues that you mentioned in your work where <clears throat> individual humans, users, um, don't know how they're being sort of um, channeled through websites, through information systems, and manipulated. So if this is already the case today, is that not a scary future then we're heading toward? Although I just want to point out there as we talk about this that while we think about algorithms now largely as machine algorithms, um, the, in the cases you point out particularly, there were algorithms in the past that were completely analog algorithms. That were just as racist and biased. That were biased. just as racist and biased and, and just as effectively removed the human category. So, you know, there were rules like three strikes and you're mm -hmm. out, which is another drug sentencing rule. Um, or, or sentencing guidelines for judges, which meant that there was an authority somewhere saying this is what you have to do, and the judge had no choice. And it was very easy, and I think this is, you know, this is the other thing because, okay, it's, it's one thing to say these are systems that we can't predict or completely understand ourselves, um, but the way, the, the way that they're being used in a lot of these cases is as a, as a mechanism for uh, removing the appearance of human element and human decision, so removing any blame. And so even though there were people involved in creating those algorithms, they may no longer understand them, but they, they were certainly involved and in, in understand parts of what they put into them. And that is not so different from the either bureaucracy or authoritarianism or any other analog function that says, uh, you cannot get to the person who made this decision, this hmm. is the way it is. I, I, the way that you phrased it now, it like, sounds like it's a, a direct continuation of like a Weber administrative science kind of approach to how to, how to run a, a, yeah, how to run people, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, to the key, sorry, key ethical concept of, uh, of accountability in the end but also some other, you know, contexts like penalty of evil, all of those like political philosophical concepts of like where do you trace it and if ever it's a black box, you know, you can know the input, the output, there are so many layers of decisions and who is to blame? Yeah, I, mean, I, I made just two points. One is just when people talk about algorithmic utopias, they often assume that this is a futuristic concept, but actually this idea has been around for at least two and a half centuries probably since the kind of birth of collection of statistics and births and deaths and so forth. Um, also, to pick up on one of your points, an important thing whenever we're imagining the future, and this is one thing I do emphasize a lot in the book, but all the other work that I do, is the problem of status quo bias, which is that we, we get very worried about the future tech without thinking about the bad features of the current reality. We assume that that is somehow, we've normalized it, we think it's a good thing, but we don't actually critically investigate and challenge features of the current reality that might be actually worse than the imagined reality. You put it, like, we went through some of the sort of um, sectors that you deal with or industries you deal with, but you kind of leave a question mark when it comes to human involvement in decision making and, and government. Well, yeah, I mean, 
And so one historical ideal of the, the leisured class is this ancient Greek society where people who are privileged and make money out of slave labor can sit back and think about philosophy and politics. Mm -hmm. And that some people have that vision that that's what we'll end up doing in the future. We will all sit back and become de facto politicians and contribute meaningfully to democratic and political decision making through collective intelligence mechanisms. Um, I, th I think that is actually maybe a forlorn ideal, partly because of the complexity of political management nowadays. And partly the same kind of argument that I have in relation to finance is that we may find that, that we've created a governmental system in which humans can no longer meaningfully participate. But that's just repeating points that have already been made here. The, I, this is not a critique to your writing, but um, behind perhaps some of that. Sounds like it might be. Sorry? <laughs> Sounds like it might be. <laughs> no, some of the um, approaches that a lot of, you know, what you write makes sense and, and was really like great to have it like down in numbers and just really see, ah, yes, um, really easy to understand how sort of, especially in agriculture, for instance, humans are already no longer part of the equation and we sort of automated ourselves out of, out of certain systems. And at the same time, it makes me think that we are just creating stark differences in the world that we live in. So whilst this might be true for a lot of Western societies, small scale farming is still what pe most people do in, uh, across the African continent, for instance. And how do we, tr seeing that these are all global developments and we live in this globalized world that does seem smaller in many ways every day, but how do we try to think about these in, as, as global dynamics and not just as dynamics creating even starker differences, as I said, between an already privileged rich elite in the West and the rest of the world? Or even between the rural and the cities, for example. If ever there's a lot of like AI, you know, proofs, for example, for cancer detection, where you have some studies showing that AI perform better at screening some images, you know, and spotting, you know, the melatonins and so seeing cancer. Because it's true, like for each patient, you have one hour of consultation for the doctor, and on this one hour, 45 minutes is screening, you know, those images, which is very tiring for a person. But what are the other benefits from it are not really accounted in studies yet, whether, you know, it's like the human contact. And so it's not just a north south divide, it's also really like a rural versus city divide, and maybe not everyone is ready for those automation for this specific reason, among others. Walk us through a little bit how democracy works in infomocracy. Um, the world votes and brings out a world government, but you no longer have the concept of nation states. That has fallen apart. Yes, so uh, the, as you said, it's around 2060, 2065 and nation states are largely gone, although there's some vestigial examples that kind of cling to this idea. But for the most part, the system of governance is known as micro-democracy. Um, this means the basic unit is 100,000 people. It could be a very dense couple of city blocks. It could be a large rural area. It's population-based. Um, and each of those units can vote for any government that it wants out of all the governments that exist in the world. So we have, uh, there's a sort of geographic anchor for those 100,000 people, but beyond that, the system of government you choose is not really tied to where in the world you are. Uh, and so it's, um, a, it's a really a, a reaction to thinking about all the many, many, many problems that nation states cause, and in particularly the, the issues, the conflicts between our ideas of democracy and of being able to choose our own government and the way that nation states try to very much control who is within and who is without, and it's based on, on very arbitrary criteria. Um, and, and so to look at uh, ways of, of doing democracy that are more localized and more granular. Which is a concept that's kind of been developing this idea of our digital tribalism and that we can find interest in peer groups, of course, people working on sort of bit nations and, thinking about how identity, which, you know, the giving of identity is very much part of the, what a nation does today, can be de-territorialized in a way. Yes, and, and we do see it starting to happen somewhat with multinational companies mm -hmm. that exist a little bit out of the nation state framework. Um, and, you know, this, this is not my ideal, again. 
Um, but we, we are seeing how that, that nation state sh framework is shifting a bit. And so they have uh, employees who may work all over the world, but still be subject to the specific policies of that company much more than to either the country they're national of or the country where they live. And again, like a big fear in that. I had mm -hmm. a panel recently on the topic of digital identity and mm -hmm. who gives, yeah, who is the controlling authority. And of course, Facebook came up as a platform mm -hmm. that is uh, potentially one of the global platforms where people can, you know, theoretically you have to give your real name, proof of ID if you want anything serious from Facebook, um, especially like closing down the site of a, of a deceased relative or something mm -hmm. like this. So very much they act as an instant of identity giver in, in many ways. And, and a service provider. I mean, we're seeing... Um, that you know, you're know, you using your Facebook ID to log into more and more other services that they're able to connect, um, or that you know Mac gets you through the app system, the app store, right? Um, and so you're seeing that as, and, and I think we're seeing also the, the role of the nation state is shifting a bit too, because what states uh, want to be responsible for providing uh, is changing in some cases. They're taking in new areas. Um, I argue in my academic work that the disaster response is a relatively new area for nation states that's becoming increasingly important and having an impact on how they govern. But on the other hand, we're seeing some states try to privatize some of their services and it's going out to these corporations. And so this it's really much more fluid than we imagine, this definition of what, what is the state and who has this authority to, to do various things. And at the moment, um, I think, you know, that is one of the biggest critiques of the internet that we live in today is that we're living in this power concentrated world of platform economy. Um, John, is that something that you also address? Like, how do we, you know, what is the perspective of breaking out into perhaps a more pluralistic or decentralized form of, of a digital future? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm noticing that this is kind of turning into a commentary on my, my book and I don't want to kind of hog the panel because I think you have probably some interesting ideas on digital participation and collective governance. Um, I mean, I'll just say one thing is that, that there's a concept of utopianism that I discuss in the book which was originally developed by a philosopher called Robert Nozick that the ideal society is not a single society, it is rather a mechanism for building many different plural societies, something he calls a meta-utopia. So one thing that we might view as a positive feature of technology is that it gives us a infrastructure or a facility for building many different worlds. Now that can be a bad thing because maybe we just become polarized and locked into our own kind of tribal sets, but also maybe it means that we can actually have a more meaningful participation in our governance because one of the problems in the modern world is this sense of disconnect, I think, that a lot of people have from governance, but yeah. So I work on AI governance, so it's very immediate actions. And something, for example, that I read uh, was maybe two, three months ago in the New York Times was this um, op-ed by Chris Hughes, who was one of the originally uh, founders of Facebook. And then he left you know, a couple of years ago. And he reached the same conclusion as we have in my think tank, which is that basically sometimes you should enforce antitrust laws to avoid concentration of power. Mm -hmm. Because the way that the social media, you know, social networks are done right now, just authorizes too much monopolization of power and access to services, and that maybe we should actually enforce some of the legal you know, um, mechanisms that we actually have. We don't have to invent them, we already have them. We just don't dare necessarily to enforce them or don't see the correlation, but he was, for example, educating for uh, us to enforce antitrust laws for Facebook to not have Instagram and WhatsApp, and you know, to sell the services. And this is something which is already there on the table. We just have to press it. So I think that's a, it's, it's exciting because if even in the US people are thinking about cartels and how to sort of, yeah, de-power Facebook by splitting up the different services and you feel like, well, well how did this accumulation of power happen in the first place? Was everybody still asleep or being bribed or lobbied um, the hell out of? Um, probably a mix of, it, of all these things. But um, the question of enforcement that you just brought up is a really important one also when thinking about AI policy. So I think in the last couple of years, a lot of great work has been done by people like yourself, people like Kay Crawford at the AI Now Institute, and a lot of fantastic ideas have been put on the table, really concrete to say, especially for public AI development, this is what you need to do. But adapting that and putting it into practice seems far away and awfully difficult. This is what we're trying to do, literally. 
And maybe to give like a brief intro to, to the room, there, when you speak about AI uh, governance, we really see three different tribes and us at the Future Society, we're really trying to make a bridge between them. There is the very short-term impact, so algorithmic bias, data privacy, so the thing you know we're confronted right now, there's maybe the short-term, medium-term impact, such as AI development, AI for good, how you know can we do those AI commons, platform for example, and then the very long-term ones, such as transhumanism, um, and existential risk. And so those three communities, AI safety, AI ethics, AI development, we need to bridge it. And the governance has to do it and find those mechanisms, you know, to do it. Um, and it can be exposed to different ways. I, I guess like for us, we really do focus, you know, on the medium terms, such as, you know, doing audits, trying to encourage some enforcement laws, um, but there's many more. What about the idea that, again, radical transparency, that we need a new system for especially AI that are active in the public sector, kind of like with patents, where you're allowed to look how it works, but not to rebuild completely, it? Completely, completely. This is something obvious. But you know, one of the biggest challenges to it, once you have, like, conceptually, you, like, got to this idea, you have a convergence within this community, is going and speak to the public sector um, functionaries, you know, bureaucrats, and trying to make them understand this idea because there's a real jet lag. That's, that's the best term I could use. You know, there's a jet lag between the competitivity and like hyperactivity of the private sector, and then there's like this passivity of the public sector of too often, unfortunately, not everyone, but too often, because they were not trained for it, they were not selected for it. And so right now what we have is like two different tempos. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole challenge is like having, harmonizing those tempos and being able, you know, to not convince those people to do it in like two years, but right now. So I think for, for us, we really want to enforce this, and some people are sensitive to it, but they don't necessarily have the, the political power to enforce it right now. Yeah, and we are on a shared mission here because um, this is also what I do. Germany is in the process of writing a AI strategy at the Ministry of Labor. We have a new sort of AI commission at the parliament, and you feel like finally politics is waking up to these topics, but at the same time, we have such a lobby-driven form of governance in, in Germany in general that it's kind of like, it's a, it's a big sort of push and shove um, overall. I'm looking a little bit at the clock because I think we only have about 15 minutes um, of discussion time left, and I do want to give you some opportunity to bring in questions or comments. So I think now is perhaps a good time to open it up and see if you want to give me a sign of hand if you'd like to contribute to the discussion. It's always a bit difficult in settings in like you know impressive theatres like this and sort of stage and audience. Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, so please feel this an open invitation. Um, if I don't see any hands going up immediately, then I'll keep asking questions, but you can just shout in and come in as you wish. Let's take a sort of, since we don't have so much time left, like a le the leap into the future. Um, we have hinted at the idea that maybe there are more symbiotic forms of machines and humans than the ones that we're thinking about today, a different form of um, of merger, perhaps. Uh, this is something that is, I think, I feel like, I don't know what you guys feel like, I feel like everybody's read Homo Deus and now everybody wants to talk about the end of the Anthropocene and how we're merging into cyborgs and how this is going to go down. So maybe you can share a little bit your thoughts um, on that with me and how you imagine this sort of more symbiotic existence between man and machine in future. Do you want to give it a first shot? <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of partly within the, the same framework as Homo Deus, uh, one of the concepts I have in the, in the book is of the cyborg utopia. So we already see people today who call themselves cyborgs. One of the examples I discuss in the book is a guy called Neil Harbison, he's an artist uh, from the UK. And he wears this antenna that goes around his head. It's actually, I think, implanted into the back of his, his skull and he's colorblind, and what the antenna does is it converts light rays into sound waves, so he can kind of hear in color. And he describes his experiences looking at artworks in the art gallery. And he is the founding member of something called the Trans Species Society. Mm -hmm. It's a society that advocates for non-human identities and non-human rights. He famously won a case against the British government entitling him to wear this antenna, he calls it an iBorg. Oh, no, he doesn't call it an iBorg. I'm, I'm confusing him with another modern day cyborg <laughs> called Steve Mann, who wears an iBorg. Um, so he, he wore it in his passport photo. Um, so I think Neil Harbison is an interesting case study of what the future might hold here 
because he's somebody who's experimenting on the sensory modalities of his body. And to set this up, within the book what I talk about is utopia as different possible worlds where we're trying to expand the horizon of possibility. And one thing I find interesting about what Neil Harbison is doing is he's expanding the horizon of possibility within the human body, within the embodied um, human form. And I think we can use technology to expand the horizons of our own physicality through different forms of integration and collaboration with technology. So that's one thing I'm interested in and keen on, although I think it does face a lot of practical impediments and risks that I also discuss in the book. I'm wondering if, so I always have a hard time with this question of like, okay, we imagine cyborgs, but when do we start? When do we stop? You know, for example, I know sometimes we have some like patches that you put inside actually your arm, you know, for contraception for women. Mm -hmm. Sometimes also now you have some people being replaced, you know, their hands, etc., with like a robotic part. When is it cyborg? Because not everything relies on AI necessarily, but it can be on automatic part being really like, you know, linked to your nervous system. So I have a hard time doing this, this differentiation sometimes. Yeah, my, my view is just that I don't think there is a hard and fast distinction between... Humans have always been a technological species. We've always used and relied upon technology. I mean, in some ways, that's the, the essence of what it means to be human, is to live in a technological ecology as opposed to a natural ecology. So we've always had some kinds of symbiotic relationships with technology. The way in which you start drawing lines, if you're interested in that, is to look at degrees of functional integration, degrees of reliance and dependency on technology, degrees of, of separability. Um, but I would certainly agree that some of the things we see nowadays that people call themselves cyborgs are doing it, I wonder whether it really is. You know, there are people who implant RFID chips in their hands so they can open doors, and I just wonder, like, why not just carry it in your hand? Why, why, why implant it? I'm, but there's an example, actually, Neil Harbison's partner is an artist who implants a chip that vibrates every time there's an earthquake. Yeah, yeah. She, she, and she moved, she, I saw an interview with her recently that she had them moved from her hands to the soles of her feet. So it was a process of the experimentation. She found this sort of seismic reaction in her hands, not as intuitive, as natural as it would be in her feet, as in like coming from the ground. Um, so obviously very interesting approaches to seeing how we can increase our and she argued this very much, increase our empathy with the rest of the world. So maybe taking on different uh, sense and senses that um, animals other than humans have and integrating them into what it means to be human. So yeah. very much coming from a biological or naturalist approach rather than just a technological one. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting, the way of like using the technology to expand our sense of empathy. Yeah, expand our sense of empathy and expand our understanding of the natural universe as well. Um, I personally, as someone who's worked in earthquake zones, find the whole idea of magnifying earthquake reactions just kind of horrifying. But, you know, they, they, have, they have a lot of other ones they talked about as possibilities that are, you know, things about um, having a... Neil Harbison, when I saw him speak, talked about having a... A, a warm spot in different parts of his forehead to know where the sun was at all times, for example. And some of these are things that we would have had as senses, you know, when, if, when we were living in a very different time with very different distractions. Um, so I, I, th I think it's a really interesting concept to, to think about linking uh, to our senses and linking to the natural world. I certainly think that, that your point, I mean, I wear contact lenses Am I a cyborg? I, ha I have some screws in my arm where I broke it once. Am I a cyborg? Um, but, you know, I think what it comes down to at the end is, is, again, these questions that we've been talking about the whole time in terms of power and choice and who has control of these technologies. You know, there's a big difference between someone like um, Neil or Moon experimenting and deciding on which senses they want to amplify and a company holding an event to put ID chips into people you know, voluntarily, but with different levels of coercion or different levels of information imbalance as to what's actually happening. Right, there's that other example of, yes, of a company that's already started just the, the key chip mm. implanted in their employers, um, which seems, again, like a more sort of down the route of efficiency and capitalism rather than down the route of empathy and increasing our contacts with other biological beings. Please, we had a question or a comment. 
Oh, thanks for the nice discussion. Um, so I was thinking about, um, do you think that we need further education in this future utopia where we have more automated processes? Or would you think everything is getting easier and we are just stupid button pressing beings without knowing what's happening? Um, I personally think we need more education starting right now or you know, as long ago as we can manage to start having more education and continuing all the time into the future. I think um, that, I mean, my, my book is largely about the impossibility of having a real democracy without having real information and real education that allows you to interpret that information. And so, yes, I think that while we have imbalances and inequalities in education, and in information, it's very hard to have a, a just world or just uses of technology. Yeah. And, and to complement that, I think uh, we really, really have to teach to be critical about those questions. Yes. Because, I mean, we're th speaking about it with uh, the speakers of the previous panel, but we're really entering a world where we are less and less going to be able to trust our eyes and our ears with the fake news, you know, with like also the speeches being put in on some videos and you can like barely differentiate this. And so we're really entering this, and this is something which is so hard to implement, right? How do you like, teach someone critical reasoning? How to teach someone to not be paranoid and to trust others while being able you know, to always stay alert and reactive? And a second point to that is that I think I'd be very careful when information seems too coherent, or when things you know seem so perfectly fitted to you, I would, I would actually be worried because maybe it's so well customized to you it's so well nudged to you that it's precisely when you don't even notice it anymore. I would also, yeah. Well, just to, just to pick up on that, we know though that this is a process that we've gone through before because I think we've all remember learning things about advertisements on the television, for example, and when you see the little words at the bottom that say something, you know, that that tells you something about what they're advertising and what they're really saying. And we've learned about things like, I don't know, it's probably different here, but in the US, for example, you know that cheese product is different from cheese, right, for example. And we've all been through the stages of, you know, watching scary movies as kids and having our parents say to it, it's not real. They, they made that. It's, you know, they, they created that out of technology. And so we have learned to be skeptical about different media in our lives, and it's just a matter of adjusting and continuing to, to educate ourselves on the new media and the new kinds of fakes that are coming out. Maybe just quickly before we take the last question, oh, I would be very curious what education and learning looks like in a work without work. Yeah, I mean, partly to pick up on this point, I think we need education to get there <laughs> if we're going to realize the, the utopia. Um, but I, the vision of the world without work is not one in which we become kind of fat, lazy, stupid beings that are. Catered, we have all our needs catered to by technology, the kind of vision of the future we see in... Wally. -E. Wally, -E, yes, <laughs> which is what I open chapter four with. Um, so I, I think we, like the idea of developing our cognition, expanding our cognition is part of what it means to have this kind of dynamic horizon of possibility. And if, you're, if, you, do, if you want to just stagnate and not explore the boundaries of possibility, you're not living in what I would envision or imagine as a utopia. And final question, please. Okay, maybe a question more to the legal academic here. Um, you said that, um, or now uh, a lot of people talk about explainable or accountable AI systems, and I was wondering, so the, the last attempts of making these systems uh, in a legal framework, so requiring companies to be, have developed transparent algorithms have failed a little so far. And I was wondering, um, how is it possible to even frame this in a legal text, or how can you even say um, that Facebook has to develop an algorithm to, mm, for the feed uh, that is somehow explainable? Um, in a legal, how can you re make them do that in, in legally, let's say? Yeah, I mean, it, we kind of, we have an attempt to do this in the GDPR already. There's, you know, there's a dispute as to whether there is a genuine right to explainable algorithmic governance in the GDPR, but it seems that there's certainly a, a nudge or a, a push in that direction. Maybe it's not a full-blown right. Uh, and they talk about, you know, access to so you probably know the text of it better than I did. Meaningful logics or something like this. 
I'll touch on the, yeah. the AI ethical principles actually are exactly this. GDPR is for the data, but for what is really for the algorithm accountability and how you put it into the legal matters is actually, well, it's happening right now. Mm. And no one is aware of it, which is the biggest irony. Everyone got to know about GDPR because you got like tons of notifications like during like two days, you know. But right now you have this year, the OECD and the European Commission have published their AI ethical principles, which is the pre-regulatory basis for the AI regulation probably in the world. The OECD principles have been endorsed by the G20 and they have a big convergence. They have five core principles among which, you know, accountability, transparency, explainability. Um, and I'm not, I don't have the solution on how it's going to be treated by Facebook, you know, or private companies, but having a convergence on the ethical values is the pre-regulatory basis. And what we're drafting right now, like some people don't dare to say, but I really do think it's, we're revisiting human declaration in the, in the digital age or AI age. And this is whatever principles we're drafting right now is gonna be regulation, I think, which can be transferred for all kind of technologies. Yeah, I mean, one thing you could talk about though is like, you know, what does it mean to have an explainable yeah. automated decision? And there are various technical proposals for what that would mean. I mean, one thing I would say is that it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have access to you know, the source code of an algorithm. In fact, that's gonna be useless to most people. Um, one proposal from a group of researchers in Oxford is this idea of counterfactual explanation, that what, what you need to know is what factor or variable you would need to change in order to change the output of the algorithm. Okay, well, what the counterfactual possibility is. Another way of thinking about this is this American philosopher called Daniel Dennett, who is this idea that you, there are three stances from which you can explain something. You can explain it from a physical stance where you look at the physical mechanisms, from a design stance, what's the purpose behind it, the goal that it's supposed to fulfill, the function it's supposed to perform, or an intentional explanation, which is like, what are its intentions and desires? He uses this to understand human behavior, but some people have argued that you could use a similar framework to understand this notion of explainable AI, that we don't need the physical stance explanation, but we need something like a design or intentional level explanation. And again, maybe just as a quick hint, like if you're interested in this and policy making in this, a lot is happening in Germany right now. So you can write to your ministry or to your parliament and find out what's going on and maybe also um, write to them and let them know what you think they should be doing. Um, since uh, we have come to the end of our time and we have discussed many big philosophical concepts, I'm not gonna ask you for a, like a visionary closing round unless you wanna offer a, a, like a leaving inspirational thought of things that we haven't talked about. What I would like to do, so you can do both if you like in the closing round, uh, what I would like to do is some um, shameless advertising and re reading recommendations as we are at the Literatur Festival. And uh, I'd like to also bring to your attention that there is a book desk outside. So if you're eager to start reading immediately after this panel, that is totally possible. Um, but I think now would be a good point in time to hold up your book. <laughs> and yeah, maybe I can't tell escape the world of work it. just yet. Um, yeah, so this is the, my book. Uh, you can buy it on, online at the end of the month. It's not available yet. But um, if you're really interested in it, I'm willing to give away my one and only copy for free to somebody who comes up to me and asks me a question afterwards. Uh, do you want it? You can get it. I'll do the shameless part because I was privileged to get sent a pre-publication copy and, um, and I'd really like to personally recommend that you read this book. I think it's very easy to read in the sense that it's um, intuitive and explains complex topics in a way that everybody can understand them and a lot of really interesting and new ideas and framings in there. I have just one point. We didn't use a, a woman on the a female uh, robo on the cover there. <laughs> it's a, cu yeah, a cupcake. <laughs> you have a short story coming out, a collection of short stories coming out a little bit later this year. Do you want to give us a little bit more info on that? Yeah, I'll do the whole spiel because I'm a writer, so please buy my books. Um, mm -hmm. I have a book called uh, And Other Disasters, which is a uh, short story and poetry collection which is coming out in November. Um, it's, for the moment, it's only available in print, not in ebook, although hopefully ebook will come as well. Uh, my other books that I talked about today are Infomocracy is the first one, and then the sequels are Null States and State Tectonics. They're available everywhere. In fact, I signed a couple of copies of two and three at the Other Lands Science Fiction Bookstore, which is somewhere near the Genesis Strasse Bahn Station. Um, it's somewhere 
that way. Uh, <laughs> but they were really nice, and they have a lot of English books as well as German books, and um, there are a couple of signed copies of mine there. And the other place you can find my writing, um, besides in lots of short stories everywhere, is uh, Serial Box, which is a company that does serial fiction in text and audio. And I created a, a cyberpunk, near future, geopolitically divided Tokyo buddy cop procedural murder mystery serial for them called Ninth Step Station, and also uh, was the showrunner for the sequel to Orphan Black, which just started running yesterday and is voiced by Tatiana Maslany on the audio. Thank you. Awesome. You've been busy. Yes. And Infomocracy is also available as an audiobook. If you get tired of reading yourself, you can yes, have it read all to of them you. Are. <laughs> Yeah, looking up to you guys. The day I have a book like this, I'll be super proud. And we have, on the Future Society side, we have uh, the report, which is available online uh, for anyone to download, which is the consultation we did on the global civic debate and everyone's citizen's perspective, basically, on the impact of AI. Um, and reports, two reports coming out this year. One of them is on the perception of ethical principles across policy and industry leaders. So if you want to know what's coming up, <laughs> have a look, because it's definitely being defined right now and another report on uh, the adoption of artificial intelligence in developing countries. Amazing, I have to say, like it's been an absolute honor and privilege for me to share the stage with you as I'm a big fan of all of your writings, fictional and non-fictional. Maybe just as a closing word, uh, we're sorry that Jonathan uh, Dotze was not here with us today. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to travel to Berlin, but of course, I also recommend reading his work. And, um, and with that, I'd like to invite you to check out the book desk and have a wonderful night. Thank you so much for being here today and joining in our discussion.